uh, uh, tells me that we still have lots of people joining, but um, we will start. Um, welcome. Uh, I hope every doing, everybody is managing well during these uh, tough times. Um, that's what brought us to having this event. Uh, my name is Carlos Cruz. I am president of Columbia Pride, which is the uh, LGBT alum organization representing, um, we welcome all alumni from all schools at Columbia. Um, I'm going to give you just a little brief overview, um, links where you can find Eric, links where you can find Columbia Pride, and my uh, LinkedIn address are all in the chat. Um, so please feel free to... Um, uh, use those links um, to keep in contact with us. Uh, you can also add, um, I believe we have a chat section. We have a chat section. So um, I know some of you submitted questions before the event, but use the chat sec uh, section if you'd like to, um, if you think of others while you are participating. Um, Adam Rosenberg, CC91, is our moderator. Um, so once I give a, a little intro on Adam, then we'll begin the event. Um, there are a couple of other members of the Pride Board that are on, so I'll have them introduce themselves along with our um, colleagues at CAA. So please, um, Jose Ricardo. Hi, I'm Jose Ricardo, CC13. Wonderful to meet all of you. Um, I am also a board member here, and I'm located in Los Angeles, wrapping up my PhD at USC in chemistry and biology. And right before this, I was working diagnostics for COVID, specifically antibodies. It's wonderful to have this conversation with you guys, and welcome. Jenna? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenna Farley Fleming. I am the Associate Director for Shared Interest Groups uh, with the Columbia Alumni Association. So I have the distinct pleasure of working with all of our shared interest groups, including of course, Columbia Pride. Um, we're so excited to have so many of you joining us this evening and we're looking forward to a great program. Uh, if you have any questions about the CAA, shared interest groups or anything else, Columbia, feel free to reach out and we're, we're always happy to help. Nick? Hi everyone, my name is Nick Benino. I'm the Assistant Director for Shared Interest Groups. I work alongside Jenna um, uh, in um, assisting her with, um, with the Shared Interest Groups. I am also the lead for um, See You There and the Alumni Leadership Group. Thank you. Uh, we had 170 people, if that was correct, um, register for the event, so um, we are really excited to be having this conversation tonight. Um, and Adam's gonna lead us off. Um, Adam is, sorry, I have to read. Uh, Adam, uh, CC91 has reinvented himself more times than most. Um, his careers have included indie film and TV marketing and distribution, investment in private banking, sales and marketing, uh, strategic market research, tech startup marketing and development, financial planning and insurance agency and more. He's perennially reinventing and rediscovering himself Yet through it all, he persists in thinking of himself, himself as a cultural anthropologist, social entrepreneur, and tubist. Um, so take it away, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mostly I ID as a tubist, I'd say to myself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means really, except that a, one who plays the tuba, but that's a long story. Um, when we were wondering, when we were thinking about what programming to do for Pride this fall, uh, I, it suddenly, well, A, I've been talking to people and I've been hearing what's been going on in people's heads, people's minds, what's going on out there. And also that immediately took me back to my own experience, my own peripatetic career. And, um, and it very much reminded me of encountering Eric Horowitz for the first time last year at uh, the C, the Columbia Alumni Association Leadership uh, uh, events. And uh, he spoke there and was so amazing and impressive. Uh, instantly he came to mind and I said, wow, we, obviously we, we need to get Eric because he's got the goods that we need at the moment. So um, let me therefore introduce Eric and get to the goods. Eric Horowitz happens to be a leader in the international world of executive coaching. He's based in New York City, uh, which many of us have heard of, and he supports 
and enhances industry experts and professionals and employees with diverse backgrounds. He's been doing it for 15 years of coaching and has worked to improve the equality and effectiveness of leaders around the world. Um, he's a, an alumnus of Columbia and he currently serves on the board of the Columbia Alumni Outreach Committee and he's head of the Columbia University Career Coaches Network. Um, he's been deeply involved in the nexus of New York cultural business and global change over the last 20 years. Not least in any sense, perhaps most, he's a proud gay dad with two kids and is also board president of the Generations Project, which provides live storytelling for LGBTQ plus community and uh, which maintains and sustains our history. So that is Eric that Horowitz good. and I'm delighted to out. pass it over to him. <laughs> Thank you. And the other thing is I did run the Hartley Kosher Deli uh, in Hartley Hall and we sold corned beef and pastrami and knishes. And I, I did that too, but I didn't tell you about that. So, um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adam. And I'm really excited to share with you guys today. And I'm, I'm gonna do a presentation. And, and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and also we'll have some time at the end for uh, specific questions, but I'd like specific questions I might answer on a more general, on a more general level when it comes to careers. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And um, what I, uh, let me get the slideshow, here we go. Okay, so you see I, I got, Gem is the name of my company, and we got some pride going here. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm really gonna actually take you up 30,000 feet. So some people during this really challenging time are like, what should I do? What font should I use on my resume? And that is so not the question you want to be asking yourself when we've had the, uh, a global pandemic, massive economic shifts, uh, cultural shifts, uh, questions about equality, everything is changing. So, you know, the resume font is not the question of the day. Okay. So, um, what I like to first have everyone think about is and if you went if you did if you did um, uh, if you were at Columbia College and you had to do the core curriculum, you always are going to learn and read about heroes. Okay, and so I want all of you to first think of yourself as the hero of your own story. Okay, and you know any hero story requires like problems. You need a hydra. You got to cut off a head, and then there's another head, and you know you gotta you gotta go to this island, and then there's a storm. So there's just no way to get through a long life without having challenges that you need to overcome. And remember, if you want an interesting hero story, there better be a lot of challenges. So first I want you to get into the mind frame of that this current situation is a very intense part of your heroic story uh, in life. So um, you, uh, sorry, okay. So the next thing I want you to do is really think about two heroes that you admire and you can write them down. One, a living hero, and this can be a friend, a partner, a family member, uh, whatever, someone you work with, and then a historical character. So somebody in history that you admire. Because on your hero's journey, you really wanna be able to reference somebody which you can read about, learn about, who can guide you because this, by the way, is not the first pandemic that's ever happened in the history of humanity. So for example, my, my dead hero is Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was actually the first life coach. He had a very specific way about how we thought about life. He wrote down 13 virtues, and then he tracked whether he was achieving each of the virtues, and he invented the post office too. So he was both thinking deeply about himself, but he was also thinking deeply about the world as well. So that's, you know, that's an individual that you, and each of you can think about and write down somebody who you see as a hero. Okay, so now I wanna give you some historical context and I'm not a historian and there might be an historian on this call. I am gonna talk about history and politics and social context with respect 
to the world and how it relates to jobs and how it relates to the pandemic, okay? So basically in the 70s, you had the beginning of personal computing and if anybody was around then, you got like this one little computer and you could type a couple words on it and that was amazing and you thought that was great and then you know you had Atari and you had the video games, right? But really what happened with personal computing was when it moved into the workforce and in the 80s, you started to be able to outsource work. So before that, you come to a desk, you had paper and you would write down on the paper and that's all had to be in one place. But with the beginning of computing, you were able to basically store information on computers and therefore release people somewhat from sitting at a desk. In the 90s, we had internet adoption and with internet adoption, we had stronger ways to communicate with each other and therefore work got easier to send around. And also starting really in the 90s, you started to have the ability to outsource things all over the globe. And also more and more things got stored online, okay? Then in the 2000s, right, because there was so much more mobility and the, the Berlin Wall fell. And remember before the Berlin Wall fell, like half of the world you couldn't even go to, right? So you had increased travel. With increased travel, I was an economics major, guess what? The prices went down. So now you could fly, you know, to London for $300, right? So people were traveling all over the world, plus they could start to work all over the world, okay? And then really in the 2010s, you have the massive explosion of social media, which brings us all closer and closer together, okay? So there's the, some of you probably heard of the six degrees of separation, which is, you know, I can be connected to Barack Obama in six degrees, right? Well, when you created Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, what happened was the six degrees between you and anyone else moved to four, okay? So we are connected to any human seven billion people by four connections, okay? So the world got super, super small and we spread out. And guess what? If there's a, a, a virus in Wuhan, China, it can spread throughout the world really, really, really quickly. But because of all that outsourcing that was happening, and the automation, when they said everybody can work from home, that was possible, okay? So in the, in the 70s or 80s, that wouldn't have worked. So you had a very quick flip in which you could go and shift. It doesn't work for everybody. And also on social economic levels, it doesn't work. But for some subset of the population, this shift was coming and this just accelerated it. Which is why I like the people not to say things like the new normal, okay? This is such a paradigm shift that we're not going, we wouldn't put this back in the box. I like for people to say, and I've been using the new work paradigm, okay? So to think about this as a new structure, which will have uh, different parts to it. Okay, so then layered upon that, uh, a little bit of a sense of LGBT, LGBTQ history in this time. And what I like to say is, you know, a lot of times people talk about LGBT history starting at Stonewall in 1967. However, I believe it started as long as there were human beings, right? And so maybe 10,000 BC. And it's always been a part of society and the world. And it, the LGBT history gets written and unwritten and rewritten over and over again. So let's just say for postmodern times, it started with Stonewall. And then in the 70s, you had many, many movements, the women's movements, um, for uh, black people movements and uh, indigenous people and gay people started to speak up and, and have a voice, okay? And then in the 80s, there, uh, starting in 1981, there was a massive pandemic. The issue is the pandemic looked as if it clearly affected one marginalized group and therefore the response was very slow, okay? However, the pandemic gave visibility to LGBT pe people, which had hadn't before, and also humanized them because people in people's families were getting sick. So it wasn't the other, it wasn't the poor, it might have been your brother, your uncle, uh, and someone in your family, okay? And then we saw in the 2000s, you saw marriage equality, economic change um, for, for our community, um, which, which moved us more visible and also in the workforce to be visible. And then in the 2010s, there are areas in the world, but not everywhere, where there is integration, right? There's global awareness, global acceptance in some area places, but also backlash. 
And for any student of history, you'll know that during, you know, let's say during a recession or a depression, people will attack, ignore marginalized groups. Okay, so that, that is a risk that occurs during these times. And as I said in the beginning, LGBT, LGBT history, unlike say, let's say Jewish history, like Jewish parents tell their history to their Jewish children, right? And it passes that way. LGBT history doesn't have that, that natural uh, sharing. So it's very important for us to be aware of it, to talk about it and to share it um, in order to sustain it. So that's, so what I did is I gave you some really big high level context about what's going on historically, what's going on in the world. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about who, who are you, okay? So fundamentally, people are what they value. And there's a lot of uh, studies that have been done in the world of uh, coaching about what motivates people. And people are actually very motivated by what they value. And things they value are truth, beauty, connection, cooperation. Like they're actually words um, that people associate with and they're motivated by if their values are in line with their life, they then will focus on their needs. And their needs is food, water, shelter, okay? If they get their needs met, then they focus on their wants. And their wants are like a nice car, or a fancy trip, okay? So this is um, you know, somewhat um, Maslow's theory around uh, the hierarchy of needs, but it's specific that this underpinning of values is really what drives uh, human beings. And during this time, if you think about it, and this one we get into the career part, it's people are not focused on their wants, right? So if you're out there selling Rolls Royces right now, you're gonna have a really hard time. So you really wanna be thinking about your, your career in the, in, the, in the needs part, like attaching to what people need now. All right, so I'm gonna do a little exercise with all of you. Uh, hopefully you can all see the screen and you have a piece of paper and a pen. If you don't, you can also do it on your computer. Um, so, I want you to start to think about maybe what you value, but I'm sorry that I said think because I don't really mean think, I mean feel. So you'll see there's about one, two, three, four, five, about 14 words. So what I'd like you to do is with your gut, not with your head, because a lot of Columbia alumni like to use their head, um, is use your gut and write down the top four of these words that resonate with you. So just look at them and go, that, that seems important to me. And only four. And I'll give you like a minute, because if you take too long, you'll overanalyze it. Okay. Uh, okay, Adam, did, I'll do an example. Adam, did you get your four? I think so. Let's try. Let's try. My, my four are catalyze, mm -hmm. contribute, uh, relate, and create. Okay, very good. Does anybody else want to share the words they came up with? Someone who's not shy? <laughs> I can share mine. So okay. mine is teach, discover, lead, and create. And would you say that your career has led you sort of in this direction? Very much so. Very much, Very much so. so. Okay. So what that means, and I guess, Adam, would you say your words and, and your journey are, are, are similar or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, so what I want you to do is, this is that core values things. A lot of people don't know what their values are because most of us are taught our values from our parents. Okay. And their values, if I did this with your parents, they'd be totally different than yours, okay? So you may not have even known that they are these. So as, as a habit, what I'd like you to do is take these, maybe put them on four yellow stickies and you know, put them on the refrigerator, okay? They're not things you need to analyze. They're just something you need to feel. feel. And as you're moving through work or human relations, you can check to see whether you're in line with them, okay? And then what we say in coaching is when you're out of line with your values, you're out of integrity. Okay. Good. All right. 
So now we're going to do another exercise. So it's like one, you kind of want to get a sense of what you value. And then if you really want to get fired up and inspired to do things in your life and to make them uh, naturally motivated is to know what you love and what you hate. Okay. Now we are socialized to not use either word. So oftentimes if I say to, let's say Adam, I said to you, um, tell me a food you love. What would you say? Cauliflower. Cooked cauliflower? Both raw and cooked. Okay. And what's a food you hate? Uh, buttermilk I have some issues with. With buttermilk. Okay. Adam did excellent because Adam did, did not switch when I said love. He said, he didn't say like. So a lot of people do that. I ask love, they say like, and I say hate, and they say I dislike. Okay. So we are all socialized to numb ourselves from what we love and what we hate. Okay. And so, for example, but when we're five years old, you know, it's like you can say whatever those things are. So, so the next thing I want you to help, help you access inside yourself is what you love and what you hate. And the way you do that is you, you can go ahead and write this on your piece of paper, certain areas in your life where you have a p deep opinions. And you don't have to share that with all of us, but um, you want to share it at least with yourself. Okay. So here are, here are areas that you want to go ahead and try this. Foods, so we did an example, like I love black olives in a can and I hate marzipan because I don't know, it looks like it could be sweet, but you put it on the cake, it tastes like kind of, I don't know, right? It's a surprise food, so I don't love, I hate it, okay? People, so with people, it can be an individual, like there could be a person in your life that you just love and adore and a person that you hate, okay? And what's really important as you're going on your hero's journey to be around people that you love and not people that you hate, okay? Or tolerate. So um, movies, like I love Devil Wears Prada. I love Gladiator. I love those two movies. Um, I don't need a, I don't know a movie. Anyone have a movie they hate? Hate. Dude, where's my car? Do, I agree with, that's a good one, right. Yes. Or Dumb and Dumber. I hate Dumb and Dumber. Okay, so go ahead. Those are some some ideas. Um, artists can be like actors, right, or actresses. I don't think she was an alumni, but I hate Anne Hathaway. I just hate Anne Hathaway, <laughs> and I, I I hate her because I feel like she wants to be liked as an actress and as a person, and it's just she's not going to get what she wants. Um, that, but that's what I'm saying. It's totally okay. All right. And then also now with work. So you could, for example, uh, I hate, you could say I hate Zoom calls or I hate making PowerPoints. Um, you know, I love uh, having uh, creative conversations at work, right? I love Excel, okay? And behaviors like, you know, I hate rude people. So for example, like, I don't know, I'm from Colorado originally. And when I came to New York, it was like, not that New Yorkers are rude, they're like just more direct. So it's just something I couldn't like reconcile the difference between sort of our, my Denver, Denverness and my New Yorkness, okay? Anybody wanna share a behavior they can't stand? Positional leadership. Okay, It'd be more specific. Um, it's, Kind of when someone, I hate to say it this way, when someone appears to be sitting on their throne and just dictating from up above. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. So, so organizations with top-down leadership, mm -hmm. you hate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that'll help you think about where you wanna work. Right. Yeah. And the kind of questions you need to ask in advance uh, accepting a job offer during an right. interview. And, and, and to add to that, the, the concept that you're, you're, you're still selling your time. So even now when it's so difficult, you have something as much to offer as the employer, okay? And you shouldn't ever forget that. And that's what this is partly meant to help you do, is to really think about where you're coming from, okay? Good. Okay, so now I'm gonna, so now I'm gonna drill down a little bit into identity, okay? 
And so remember when I showed you the historical context, like even the notion of a specific identity, right, is more of a modern uh, concept. And now I'm gonna relate that just to work, okay? So the point B, and here's the example I'm gonna give you. See, I showed you a picture of some oatmeal. But essentially, the way to think about it is, within each of us is a seed, and that's our childhood, how we were raised, um, the people that we were around, how we feel we are, okay? And then the fruit is how we appear, right? So the seed grows into the fruit, and the fruit is what people see about us. Now, everyone we work with is, an, uh, is another fruit with a, with a different seed and growing into a different fruit. And we all are sitting in the same fruit bowl, which cannot be changed, okay? So um, when you go to work, right, you might be coming in with all these seeds that nobody sees, right? But you also don't see the seeds in every other, in every other person, okay? But the fruit bowl can't change. All right, so now uh, let me take this and now, um, let me just take this now into your work life, okay? So, um, and I'm just gonna kind of conceptually talk about these things very quickly, but things to think about. So, so your sexual identity, right? I mean, in one way is not related to work at all. Like if work is I gotta do public speaking or I gotta write an Excel spreadsheet, that does not directly have something to do with your identity. However, your identity, has an impact in how you navigate the work world, okay? So I, I like to just try to separate those two um, because we're multifaceted, right? So number one, um, when it comes to identity and work, what's very important at work is community, the community of people that you work with, okay? And so depending on which community you're existing in, right, um, you may be included or excluded. Okay. In addition, at work, there's a high prevalence around social norms. So for example, it, it, it has been true in the past that it used to be that men at work, uh, cis men could, at work could talk about women in a certain way. But if a, if a gay man spoke about his relationships in the same way, it would not match the same social norm. Okay. And that is half changed, not fully changed. Um, there's marginalization at work because of, so, you know, for example, if a certain group of people go to the same work and they go to the same church or the same golf, golf, they are going to be together in the same group, okay? So marginalization can happen because of the way groups come together. Um, another thing what's very just generally important at work is to take your identity through a positive lens, not a negative lens, okay? Which is just, that's a state of mind, okay? The other thing is, is, and this happens at, at, with a lot of special, special interest groups within corporations, I'm not talking about this one, where the, a lot of people in marginalized groups go to this, these groups, but that separates and isolates them from where business is done, and business is done, and politics is done, and, and sometimes other places. So um, you can lead to isolation by just sticking with your own communi community in a workplace. And again, this is something I coach people on all the time, which is internal politics. So once you get to a certain level in an organization, it's about 80% politics and 20% work, okay? Because the people doing the work are down there doing the work. The people getting paid the most money are the ones communicating and talking to each other. So being aware of internal politics is vital. And because of your identity, it affects your political standing, okay? Um, there are certain skills, skills that we have and special skills we have. Remember, if I go back to the seed, um, being, growing up and navigating your childhood, for example, in a world in which maybe you couldn't be yourself, actually lends itself very well to the corporate world and the politics and the difference between what people say and what people mean, okay? So we wanna think about the skills we've gained from the life we've lived on our hero's journey. In addition, there are liabilities that come with it just because of the state of human beings. Um, one thing I, I, I wanna want uh, people to understand is we talk a lot about the glass ceiling. There's 500, the CEOs of the Fortune 500, there's 500, there's only four women, okay? So clearly there is still a glass ceiling, correct? 
So there, there is that glass ceiling, but it's related to femininity in general, okay, also. In other words, like men were in business for 6,000 years before they even let women in in the 60s and 70s. So there's already a bias towards femininity. And then, for example, if you are not identifying in a masculine way, you will have another ceiling that's going to, to happen to you as well. Okay, And these things are not always overt. Sometimes they're very covert. They're not going to say it to you. You just aren't, don't get a foot at the table. Okay. Um, and the final thing I just want to say, just these are things to be aware of, is the catch-22 around, uh, around what I'm just saying, which is you, you have to, there are situations not, you know, the world is absolutely changing in many ways, where you have to do the work to conform, and then you also have to do the work. So the catch-22 is you're double working, right? Because you're working to conform to certain something, and then you have to do the work where someone else is just doing the work, okay? And that requires extra labor, and that requires you to have, you know, take more time and more energy around whatever it is you're doing. So those are just some of the challenges, but I don't view any of them as roadblocks, okay? I just say I need to be aware of them, I need to be conscious of them. For example, I worked with a company, the CEO was French, and anytime I said something, he repeated what I said in a high-pitched voice every time, right? Which, you know, gets under your skin if you keep having to deal with that, right? And these things pop up sometimes. And so I, you have to do enough internal work to really separate yourself from these situations as best you can. Okay, now I wanna um, layer on top of all, all of that exciting stuff is the way the world is changing in a way that'll help you think about where you want to direct your career because the world's moving in in a very interesting and new direction. Okay. So my fellow Colombians, uh, there is an attack on intellectualism and knowledge, right? So science isn't necessarily true is what we're going through. So if you have a career that built yourself on that, you have to understand that there's a shifting roll around it, but then obviously there's going to be a, a need for it even more once we realize like science actually is true. Um, again, the world is so close and so connected. So here I could be, I mean, on this call might be people from all over the world. That wasn't happening pre-COVID in the same way, okay? So we've gotten a lot closer. Um, in every business, there is a changing business model. For example, I, you know, I work with people in real estate and they keep saying when everybody comes back to the office, Okay, everybody's not coming back to the office ever because too many people really like the way it is now and some people really hate it and some people are in the middle and some people are gonna like it and then they're gonna hate it, okay? Because we can't all hang out in the same bar, we're building new tribes, right? So new tribes are being formed in different ways. What we're doing tonight is a, is a tribal creation that we're generating. Um, in the, in the 70s, 80s, you know, an editor of a magazine was very influential, okay? Now, if you have 40,000 40, 40, TikTok followers, you know, you can drive the conversation, okay? Um, technology, automation, and AI. We're all at home. Guess what? The technology companies now know, I know, I don't know, like 12 million more things about you than they knew before COVID. And they can feed you exactly what you think you want to hear, okay? Um, but there's a lot of opportunities in that. Uh, a, in a wonderful way, there is even heightened awareness of the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's the topic of the day, and we are seeing more and more marginalized groups saying, I don't want to be marginalized anymore, and what I want to say to you is, this is going to continue for 30 years, because what's going to happen is, is more marginalized groups who didn't realize they were marginalized will come forward and say, I'm not going to be unequal anymore. Okay, so it is, it is something that will continue in a good way. Um, I used to buy the Coca-Cola and I drank it because it tasted good, okay? So now I have to know what Coca-Cola's supply chain is, who works for Coca-Cola, why they've chosen and where they stand on every issue. So what, and I am not saying this because I think it's wrong, I think it's right to say we are now asked to question the morality of everything that we purchase as consumers, okay? 
And finally, and this is why there's this thing called career coaching, because a hundred years ago, if you were a man, you worked in a coal mine, you died at 14. And if you were a woman, you died in childbirth. Okay. So there was no career coaches because you didn't necessarily live past 16. Okay. So now life expectancy is going to be like 130. So what's happening for all of us is you're not going to just have one career. You're probably going to have five. Right. So understanding that the world is giving us opportunities to reinvent ourselves like Adam, like reinventing ourselves um, many, many times. Okay, our next fun exercise, uh, put a little rainbow there for everybody, which is, oh God, oh my God, the whole world's changing. What am I gonna do? I can't handle this, right? I'm so overwhelmed. Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna be a strategist, okay? So I want you to all think five years from now, you're gonna make a guess. And you can pick from the topics that I'm showing here, public health, government and politics, technology, entertainment, the welfare system and food service. What is going, the world gonna be like in these areas? You can pick one, you can pick, you can pick all of them. But, and this is a brainstorming thing. So I guess what I'd like, can someone shout out in five years, something new or different in public health? Maybe a global internationalized system of uh, checking your health. Yes, like yeah. an app, a, a global app that says whether someone has COVID or not. Yeah. Yes, that's a great, great thought. Okay, someone throw out one government and politics five years from now. I feel like there will be um, more unification amongst leaders because it's so politicized and um, divided now. Okay, so you know there will be a backlash to the isolationism mm -hmm. towards, yes. Um, I feel like it started already and it'll, it'll just continue and increase. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I, I think also like, for example, like if I can do all my credit card transactions online, I think voting will be digital, it seems to me, right? Um, okay, good, technology, five years. It'll kind of be like plumbing. And I think at the turn of the 19th century, there was no plumbing and sewage was going all through New York City. And now everybody has indoor toilets. So I think it'll, it'll become like that. What, Where, so is that, is that explain, what do you mean? So, so in, apparently sewage is like the fact that we have plumbing lines going through all neighborhoods and it's yeah. just like a public thing is something that happened in the last century. So I think technology will become like sewage or like it'll just ah, the right, channel right. that connect us everywhere. Everywhere to everything. Um, okay, I am sure I'm going to get drone groceries, for sure. What else? Anyone else have one on technology? More backlash against data mining. Mm. Got it. Yes, which is, which is people getting off of the system, right, trying to get off the grid, right? And um, I imagine we'll see less people person yeah. to person like this we'll probably have like mirrors where we see people and we'll see digital people a lot but we'll probably only see our family or two or three people in our family right, right. in person right one thing i think that i'm hearing in the work world is you you will work from home right 11 months and then the company will fly you to a hotel in the bahamas for a three weeks or a month where you'll all work and get to know people and that'll be the expense that they're spending on space and which is a lot cheaper than having a whole floor in the empire state building okay all right the welfare system who has something five years from now in a country like india absolutely nothing you know the welfare system will be enough food so you can do whatever job you have to do press whatever button you need to press mm. right 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 so in five years that won't change not but in the US, maybe public health. Mm. So my, my theory is it's already kind of started is UBI, universal basic income, because essentially giving 30 to 40 million people so much unemployment that they've been doing, you're essentially creating a UBI. And you know, it's very hard to take away something once you've given it. And what I, I personally like UBI, because that way, when you have another crisis, you don't then have everybody on the streets, right? So air is free. So why not like, you know, make food free by a UBI. Um, okay, and then anyone, anyone have any food futures? 
Can I touch back on the on the welfare system, which yeah, I found sure. very inter interesting that you said. I mean, here here in the UK, at least they're they're they've been paying everyone at least eighty percent of their salary, right. and that expires next week. I mean, next month. But um, I see it as a way to keep the peace in certain countries. Um, so I I find that very interesting just to have that UBI, which would be great. And um, again, I, I don't know if it was just a test. I don't know if the UK has done that before. And then also that they had this program called Eat Out to Help Out, which right. the government was giving 50%, I mean, paying 50% of your bill to certain restaurants. And it did stimulate a lot of economy and people were going out. Um, so that would be nice that maybe the government subsidizes you in a more um, obvious way. I mean... Um, yeah, so I, I say what you just said is great. And I want to tell you a very fascinating difference between the UK and the US. They just passed a law in New York that there's a 10% tax to eat at a restaurant. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, I know what's going on in the UK that you said. I'm like, that's so crazy because really it should be, we're doing exactly the opposite of what we should be doing, right? Right, exactly. Okay. Especially okay. in New York where there's food insecurity and supermarket does. There's no supermarkets, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, what I, what, and remember, I told, I'm going to keep you guys at this kind of high level when we're talking about careers. Like, it's not about what you're doing now. Is you want to chase the puck, okay? And with your education and your thinking and your intelligence, get out of the now and get into the future. And not only when you get into the future from a career perspective, you can also change the future with your influence. Okay. Now I'm going to do a little bit about, uh, and I'll try to do this, this is more about you yourself and like how to function and not go insane during this time. Okay. So what I like to just say is because, you know, I think it may like every day blended into every other day, basically <laughs> <laughs> like, and it was like groundhog day. Um, divide your, divide your time into daily, weekly, monthly and annual buckets. Okay. And now here are some good tips for some daily habits. Okay, so number one is meditation. There's a lot of great meditation apps, Headspace, uh, Calm. It's gotta be a daily practice. Meditation is essentially, if you wanna think about it, meditation is like too many apps are opened in your head and it's like turning off your head, like your phone, and then you turn it back on and the phone works, okay? Stretching, because we're all cramped up and smushed and not moving. A happy friend, and you don't have to call your happy friend every day, you can text them, but somebody who's not all doom and gloom, okay? Because this too shall pass. This is an opportunity. So you, you don't want to surround yourself with people who are telling you that it's the end of the world. And if you are one of those people who are telling everybody that it, it's the end of the world, you're not a happy friend, okay? Track your eating. You know, binge eating at night can totally happen because also, I mean, you only care, I only care what you see from my like, you know, shoulders up, right? Uh, Limit social media use, kind of a before, a middle, and after in time with that. And in order to beat the AI system, like things that are opposite of what you like, okay? Because it'll fool the algorithm, which will not get you into a, into a bubble. Some sort of workout routine and multivitamins. Okay, so that's every day, try to do those things, okay? Then, and you can, there's a good tracker, it's called Streaks. You can track them on an app. And what's good about using it, your phone for positive apps, it also balances out the negativity that's coming through your phone. Okay. Uh, on a weekly basis, and I, I always do this on Saturday or Sunday, I like review my finances, what's, what I'm going to spend this week, what I'm going to make, uh, read or listen to self-help uh, uh, books. Uh, there's this thing called Headway. It's a good app. It has just you know, positivity and self-help books, but you're learning. So it's okay to, I mean, we all love to learn. You can learn 15 minutes a day. Uh, pick a weekly news summary. What's great, I like is the week, which is more so in the UK, where it sums up the week because the daily news is just dribble, okay? Plan your week. So I also sit down on the weekend, map out how your week is gonna go. Because if you don't, you're at, the, you're at the behest of other forces. Stop doing something. So, so every week I try to like not waste, figure out something not to waste my time with. And then finally, I like to say, forgive someone. Because this time is so frustrating. People are getting so mad at each other. I've written e obnoxious emails to people because I misunderstood what they said, okay? So I forgive myself or forgive when people do that to me because um, we're in this situation. Okay, 
monthly, make a monthly budget, build your community. All of you showed up tonight. If you stay connected to us, you're building your new tribe, okay? We may never meet each other, but we could be in the same tribe, okay? Clean your house, find a creative outlet. And I say that in two ways, which is, I told you guys gotta get ahead, gotta get into the future, gotta see what's happening. In order to do that, you gotta be creative. So you can do that two ways. You can virtually go to the, the museum. You, I think now you can actually go to the museum, right? Or you start an art project. Um, get a change of scenery. Like I'm going down to Miami in two weeks. I just, I gotta go somewhere else. Um, once a month with a boss or with a worker, communicate something and try to resolve it. But not every day, okay? And then remember I said every week you should forgive someone and once a month you should forget something that wasn't really valuable. Okay, now finally, um, what you should do on an annual basis is you should have annual goals. And if you have them in January, you can throw them out. I'm sorry, go back up the page. Um, make a COVID time capsule. Take some of the really special, weird, important things that you experienced during COVID and make a little box and put them in a box. Cause like four years from now, you're not, you're gonna remember like what an amazing uh, experience this was on, uh, and it'll have what it taught you on your hero's journey. Um, you can make and work with a coach and create a three-year career plan with the future in mind. Have a mentor, a coach, a, a best friend, somebody that you uh, respect um, and be willing and I say this to people, to start over. It's okay. Start over. Because you might be in an industry that is, doesn't exist anymore and isn't going to be. So somebody who was a horse, who, who drove a horse bo uh, tr board truck, you know, like a horse thing, you know, in Manhattan, whatever, when the first car came along, he's like, eh, that's a fad, right? He was wrong or she was wrong. Okay. The last thing I wanna just go over and, and um, have you really think about uh, during this time is Ikigai. So Ikigai, and I'm pronouncing it correct now, is a Japanese philosophy. And I, my, my minor was Japanese uh, in 1990, but that has nothing to do with anything. Um, <laughs> and there's an island, Okinawa, uh, there's an island in Japan where everybody lives 120. They live like a really long time and they're healthy and happy the whole time. So their philosophy that they live by the whole time they're alive is called Ikigai. And what I'm showing you in this picture are the four main elements of it about how they think about their lives and then the integration of those things. And you can Google this and I'm, I'm gonna find a way to share uh, all the stuff we're doing, plus that we're recording this, so you'll be able to go back and look at it, um, which is number one, what am I good at? Okay. Number two, what do I love? Which we talked about, we can find out. Number three, what does the world need now? Okay. Not what you're going to try to sell the world. Okay. And finally, that which you can get paid for. So when you combine all those together, what you can see is it will result in your passion, your mission, and if you're mission driven, vocation is how you can like make money and your profession is your career. The ultimate goal, and when I work with people in coaching is you wanna, you're circling the star. You wanna get all the way to the right where the star is. And that can take you 10 years or 15 years. Cause you can find something you love and then the world doesn't need it. Or when you started it, the world didn't need it and now it does. Okay, last things. So this is just kind of a recap for all of you about to stay inspired because I'm not gonna be on your Zoom every day calling you up and saying, hey, what's going on? You're feeling depressed. I know, Adam, sorry. I could text you, but okay. Number one, these are the things that are gonna keep us strong is community, building, maintaining a community. Number two is these apps that I've described, which is using your phone as a source of inspiration, not a source of depression and sadness. So Headspace is meditation, Headway is um, uh, self-help, streaks, tracks, like how many times I did yoga, and Audible is good for you know books, listening to books, and also sometimes games are good online because it just distracts you from the madness. 
art, museum, music, beauty. Don't, don't lose those things. Physical exercise and movement. Okay, this one's super important. Control your inputs and outputs. Meaning, you know, anybody can email you. That means that you don't have control of your inputs. So really thinking about who's in your space and then what you're sharing. Because if you're sharing stress, it, 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 it spreads like, like wildfire. Sorry for that analogy. Um, and really, and this is where you can use books and philosophy is like learning what you can control and what you can't control. I did not create a pandemic and nobody on this call did, right? And your job and Columbia and the, nobody made it. So we're not in control of it. So you have to be able to work within the fruit bowl knowing that you can't control things outside the fruit bowl. And the last thing I wanna say is learning to stay in integrity. And integrity, I don't mean just be honest. What I mean is your, your value words, okay? Knowing what they are and living by them and looking and saying, am I living by them? For example, for me, my, two of my main value words are inspire and empower, and empower. I need to inspire myself, okay? I was a, uh, you know, a hick closeted kid from Denver, Colorado, and now I get to do what I'm doing now. And that inspires me because that's a dream of mine. And empower is what I do for a living is I find ways to give other people the, the power to do what they need to do. So that means I'm in integrity. If I'm coaching someone I can't empower, I'm out of integrity. And then I have problems. Okay, so it looks like uh, we're ready to answer some questions and thoughts and sharing. So uh, Adam, you wanna tell me what we got? Eric, we did have one request um, yes. from, some, from Gloria. Yes. Go back to two of the slides that you shared. Sure. Weekly and weekly commitments. Uh-huh, and go over them again. I don't know, Gloria, feel free to, to yeah. check in. I don't know if she just wanted to take a picture or she wanted yeah, to sure. again. Um, I also understand that this is being recorded and being made available after, so I don't want to take up anyone's okay. time. Okay, all right, that's fine. Well, Thank there, you. Yes. Um, oh, there it is, thank you. There it is, yeah, I did it, it was so fast, it was so easy. Okay, these are, so I just want to say with the daily ones, not only write, you know, take a picture, write them down, find a way to track them. It's the only way you're going to realize that you went three days without meditating and then you went off on your, you know, your colleague at work and you don't know why. <laughs> okay. And again, meditation is super important for uh, Columbia grads because you have active minds and not everything you think is really going to help you. Okay. So you, you can't think your way out of every problem. All right. Was that good, Jenna? Yes. Thank you. All right. All right, Adam, you're up. Now it's the, well, it's the lightning round. Okay, uh, there are some questions that people sent in in advance. Okay, yeah. Um, and let me, let me uh, share a few with you. Any thoughts, Eric, on how virtual law firms are doing? Oh, that's very specific. Um, so, so my, okay, so I actually, with people that I'm working in the legal arena, they are busier and they're not busier. So it's a bit of both, okay? Because there's a lot of transactions going on. And to my AI point, there is a direct threat to in the legal profession because so much of it can really be automated, okay? So when you're thinking five years ahead, there's a lot of what's done very manually uh, or uh, process driven in the legal profession that will get automated in ways you can't even imagine, okay? Ding, ding, ding. Next question. Yes, go ahead. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. Next, next question. Um, how, how can someone get better involved with queer professional networks? Mm, okay, that's a good question. That is a good question. Number one is here, right? So this is a community in which connecting with people in this community is a way to connect with them. Secondly, join uh, LGBTQ nonprofit, uh, get involved and volunteer. Because all of the, every, for example, I, I run the Generations Project, I'm uh, the president of the board, and what we do is we uh, have older LGBT people tell stories to younger people because these, these stories are, are getting lost. We were doing these 
not virtually, right, in person, and now we're doing them virtually. But all the people that come, workplaces, right? So a lot of people don't understand it, that when you volunteer, you connect with people in a way that gets you into career opportunities. And people get to see you working and helping in different ways, right? And what's really beneficial is that you then generate global networks that nobody else has, right? So if I join a group and I'm working with LGBT people in London, other people can't, don't have those connections. So you build strong, intricate connections that other people don't have, which gives you an advantage. I nailed that one. I did, Adam. Thank you. I, I, I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fine. Let's, okay, let's see one. if you let's see if you can nail this one. Okay, let's I'm see. Uh, this is a trickier one. Oh, God. Uh, how can one reframe their skills and experience getting out of a particular field when that's what defines your resume for the last five years? That is a I'm gonna nail this question, but that was a great, it's a great question. Do we know who, who asked it? We no, I do, I don't know who asked it. You don't know. Anime. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, well, whoever you are, props to your question. So I'm gonna give you guys a way to do this. This is number one on how to transition careers, okay? So number one is, remember I went back to the hero story? So what I want, what you do first is you write down the three greatest moments in your career, like in paragraph, like, for me, I did a Hartley Kosher Deli. I sold more corned beef than anyone, okay? Um, so your three career, from childhood, like, like if you had an amazing lemonade stand, one career disaster, something really terrible, okay? And then the fifth story is your imagined future, okay? So you look at your resume, forget your resume for a second, write down these five stories. Then what you do is you map all your career uh, activities, to those five stories in some way, okay? And that becomes your bio. And like I told you guys before, nobody actually, people are not reading resumes, okay? In HR, you know what they do? They Google you. And then they look at your Facebook and they look at your Instagram. And if you are friends with someone they didn't like in high school, you don't get a call back, okay? Plus there's the whole AI algorithm that goes on with resumes where basically, the exact person they're looking for, it doesn't even exist, okay? So I will say two things. Number one is do this exercise of being able to map your resume to your future. Number two, understand that it's a story that you need to tell, right, to convince. And number three, that technology and AI is affecting how, like, how things are sorted and building a strong human community can get you around the technology. I, I mean... That's my answer. I have to admit, you yeah. nailed that one as well. I did. I, I really did. That like <laughs> if you. I mean, if we had like one of those, you know, like you could give me like a, a gymnastic grade or something. <laughs> oh wait, 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 here we go. Here we yeah, go. Good. I, there we go. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Next one. Okay, next one. Next one. And guess what? Everybody out out there in Zoom land, you could be typing yeah. these questions into the chat. And, yes. And. And don't okay. be shy and make them hard. Don't like, be shy. Don't let, be shy. Let, go ahead. I got, I can do it. And if you want to be anonymous, you could send it privately to me and you could say, I'd like to be anonymous. Here's my yeah, question. That's fine. Too. FYI. FYI. Uh, so here's a question. Okay. Um, the questioner asks, I have a master's in developmental and educational psychology from teacher's college and a master's in clinical social work from Columbia university. Uh -huh. It'd be interesting to know what lucrative fields one could go into. That's uh, the question. That's the question. So developmental and educational psychology and clinical social work. Okay. So whoever you are, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, depending on, do you want to make a lot of money? Is it like, you, it depends what they want, right? Do they want to do something that's there? their career can earn a lot of money? Do they want to be fulfilling? Do they want to make social change? But generally, for example, that person is in my world. And my world is organizational design, right? Uh, life coaching, career coaching. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people looking at, and I'll just explain this, like a lot of times when I help companies reorganize, a lot of the reorganization of offices is very much related to the space. 
So who goes where and who sits next to who and who gets an office is very um, related to space, okay? So all those cars just got thrown up in the air, right? So how human beings interact with each other and develop is completely a new field and a new science. There are some banks already who are making everybody go back. So why are they making everybody go back? They said everybody could stay till January, right? Because um, your email is owned by the company. And IBM Watson basically runs all everyone's work email through their system to figure out how motivated everybody is. Because you know what? The way you write an email, when you wrote an email, you write me an email, it takes me three hours to write back, that's slowing down. So they ran the program and they figured out that everybody working from home was not working as hard as they were working in the office. Okay, so they really saw a drop in productivity. Okay, so they're going to bring them back, but I, you know, you can't have more than three people in an elevator. So that whole way in which we work is going to be a field. So it seems to be from the skills this individual learned that those skills could be applied in, the, in all those areas. Like, I guess work is the new, like, or it always was, but now it's really the new, like, you know, petri dish lab. To use, okay. to use a, a frightening metaphor. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, right. I Look, I said something about forest fires too. Yeah, not good, um, whatever. Okay, go ahead. One more it? question, one more question. And then we leave it up we, to the audience. Well, guess what? They can always jump in, listen. That's true, okay. Uh, maybe we'll start calling on people, I don't know. Anyway, uh, here's a question. I'm trying to move into the software engineering world. I majored in physics and minored in CS, which I imagine is computer science. My dream job would be as a game developer. How and where do I get my foot in the door? <laughs> the way he read, I was fascinated. <laughs> I don't know, he just read it well. Um, okay, so, um, you want to get into, and I'm going to be more general about this. You want to get into an industry you're not in. Is that fair? Although they studied for it, uh, they majored in physics and minored in computer science. Yeah, so I'm dividing what you learned in school and the marketplace of work. Okay, and those are two different things. Okay, like I was an economics major, but there was no, in 1990, which was a recession, there were no jobs in finance. Right? So there was not a connection between my education at that moment and the job marketplace. So all I'm say, what I say first is think about that as a separate thing. It's great that you have those skills. What it is now is, is like the, every industry is a marketplace, which has people that know about that marketplace. And so what I would say to do first is, you know, follow blogs, Instagram, TikTok, uh, do news alerts on the industry. Okay. Then find the influencers of the industry, follow them, okay? The one thing that's amazing nowadays where we've had a major breakdown in old systems is you can direct message someone on Instagram who's famous or important, and guess what? They might respond, okay? So you can go through all those other loops. If you, if you message them with the right interesting thing about how you can benefit them, you'll get a response, <laughs> okay? So what I say is it's a separate marketplace, it's something you have to do. There are ways to learn it digitally. And then you just, and then, and I also say this, depending on your financial situation, is volunteer. Because if you volunteer to help, you'll learn something. And if you learn something, you learn something. So for example, I was very interested in the Olympics in 2012. So I volunteered for the Olympics to get the Olympics in New York City. And you know what? I met some interesting people and I was in charge of doping for archery because apparently sometimes archers like, take dr uh, drugs. <laughs> so who knew? Okay, good. So do we, that's all of our written questions. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody? That's the, yeah, yeah that, that's all. That, that's all that we've got pre prior to the event. Okay, good. Okay. Anybody have a want to share a thought? And I will call on <laughs> people for something specific once we finish the questions. I have a thought. Here's the thought. Yes. Um, I am reminded again, as, as you pointed out, volunteer for stuff is a hugely beneficial activity. Um, so many of my career opportunities and turns have come from when I was involved in, in volunteer activities, things beyond, above and beyond, uh, you know, just 
that, that weren't just elamosphery, seeking money or work, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and recently, my, um, my, um, a friend of mine and I have just been looking at the political environment, how transformed it was. We were already getting involved in the, uh, you know, just in preparing for the upcoming presidential elections, but the, the pandemic has changed everything. And ultimately I found myself getting pulled into a political campaign. And I'm telling you, I'm meeting the most fascinating people. I'm learning, I'm learning a ton. It's, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. It's, it's, right. it's, it's pro providing a number of new networks, new introductions, new opportunities. You Could are, ex in yeah, so you are corroborating and extolling my suggestion to volunteer. Yes. Right, because yeah. it's a great way to form new networks. Okay, looks like we have one more question and one more. <laughs> Actually, two more. One more question from, from Gloria. Yeah. Okay, Gloria. Okay, tips to develop executive presence. That's a good one. That's like, that's probably like a four hour seminar. Okay, so um, let's, all I'll say, I'll say a couple things. Number one, go back to your values, right? Because you want your executive presence to reflect your value system. Okay. Number two, uh, there are lots of things around hand motions, voice tone, what you wear, how you talk. It used to be where you sat in a meeting was very important in terms of executive presence um, and the language that you use. And, and probably the most important thing I would say, and what we call it in coaching, it's called messaging. So what I would say to you is, is one thing you want to develop, I call it the two brains. Okay. So right now I'm talking to you. This is going to be a very meta thing I'm saying. I know I'm talking to you. Well, how do I know I'm talking to you? Because I have a brain and, I'm, and it's thinking and it's thinking, what should I say? Okay, so those are two brains. As a closeted gay man for many years, I can tell you I perfected the two brains, okay? But if you wanna be a great executive, you have to be able to use those two brains appropriately, which means I think about what I'm gonna say, I evaluate what I'm gonna say, and then what I say, I say briefly and succinctly. And that commanding way of speaking will make people listen to you, okay? But you have to become aware that you have two brains, the brain that's thinking and then the brain that knows to speak. And they're actually separate and you could slow down enough, you can do it, okay? Um, Gloria, was that helpful? Extremely. Okay, good. So, the, two brains, the two brains concept makes perfect sense. Awesome. Uh, and it's such a super powerful thing. And you know, like even like right now I'm talking to you, but I'm also, I'm thinking of something else. See what I mean? Like I can mm -hmm. talk and think because I already thought about what I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. That was a great question, Gloria. Thank All you. All right, you're welcome. One more, tips to take steps to join, be invited to join a board. Okay, good question. Back to Adam's point, volunteer first. So for example, I run the Columbia University Career Coaching Network. I was just one, of, I volunteered to be one of the coaches to provide this type of uh, content after 2008. And after four years of being very diligent about it and being a good volunteer, they said, Eric, could you run it? Okay, so that, that, that built up to the point that I was on the board of that organization. And then Columbia has a digital outreach group, which is like, how do we reach out to all the 300,000 alumni digitally? And they said, Eric, your expertise here, we'd like you to be on this board. So, so number one, no one's just gonna look at you and go, oh my God, you belong on our board, right? Find volunteer opportunities and do the work and build yourself up and show your skill set and your commitment and then uh, you'll get there. I don't, Carlos, I guess, I mean, you're, you're running the, the pride, like how did you get here? Um, well, many, re many yeah. reasons. Um, partly was I wanted to meet other people and, and some of those, other reasons are um, I wanted to give back to the community. I wanted to build community. And then there were less altruistic reasons like, um, you know, I wanted to meet people who would need me in certain professional and maybe personal mm -hmm. avenues right. that I wouldn't have met before. And also, I mean, come on, um, like you, you mentioned before, like Columbia graduates tend to be very accomplished. We think a little too much, but that's a good thing sometimes. And so it's a good group to be around. Right. And I'm always inspired by you know, he listening to you or other people that I come across. So the way I, I would reflect that back to the question is like, you didn't think I want to be on a board. You thought of all these things that you needed in your life. Yeah, exactly. 
and, and then, how it fit into my value system and, right. and how I could give back. Right. So hopefully that, that helped with that question. Okay. So Eric, uh, er, not me, Eric, Eric said, okay. So, so I think I'm going to kind of like, if we don't have any other questions, I, I, I actually will, uh, oh, I do have another question. Um, okay. So uh, let me answer the question and then I, uh, uh, okay. So the question that we have here a little bit is around personal branding from Nick. So, uh, Google, I, you can all do it right now. Google yourself. You want to know what your brand is? Google yourself. Okay. That is where personal branding starts now. Okay. And so if you want to develop your personal brand, number one, know what you look like online. Okay. So for example, I'll tell you what my political contributions were to the, to what party. Um, but then you can build your brand around that. So the way you do that is you then, for example, if you post on Instagram or you post on Facebook or you get an article written about something, that's gonna show up on your Google, right? And once it does, then that's the story you're telling the outside world about who you are, okay? And the, the thing you don't want is if you, you, know, if you Google yourself and there's nothing there. Um, for me, there's a oncologist who's also named Eric Horowitz and he actually gets published all the time. So I kind of like fall onto page two. So I'm gonna have a conversation with him. Um, anyway, so developing your personal brand is number one, understanding your values and your resume, and really you're building your personal brand, especially now, digitally. Okay. Um, all right, there's no, uh, Dan has a question. How would you approach returning to work after a, you're welcome, Dan. Oh, a break of 12 years, I have two, okay. So if you, um, w uh, for example, there is a Columbia, uh, Thing it's called I relaunch. It'll be in October, which really helps with people who are returning to the workforce, who have been out of the workforce for a while. But what I would repeat what I was saying around if you want to do a career transition, which is think of your three great experiences, like your three uh, three accomplishments and your one failure and your future. Because what you would be saying is, let's say you were took a break for 12 years and maybe you were raising children or you went on a massive camping trip around the world. This is part of your story, right? So if you tell your story well, that will translate to the listener if the story resonates with them. Okay? And- Thank you. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Dana? Just wanted to say thank you. I have attended the uh, I relaunch okay, good. conference a couple good. of years ago, but still, uh -huh. yes. no luck. No yeah. luck. So, so again, I think when you're when you're thinking about it, you really want to think about like what is the story that you're telling, and who are you telling that story to? And it's really important to tell that story in a way, like I'm saying, in the hero way, rather than you're like, oh, I got a, you know, like I have a PhD, right? Mm -hmm. It's more like you weave that into the story, but it isn't the story. Right. Right. Um, okay, good. Thank you. So, you're welcome. No, thank you. It was a good question. And, it, and I just want to say, look, I was an executive at PricewaterhouseCoopers for 12 years and I wanted to be a life coach, right? So for me to change from what I was doing to what I wanted to do, I had to tell the story of all those years of PricewaterhouseCoopers in a way that would resonate with somebody who's trying to make a life change, right? So if I said, well, you know, I help people with their HR and I solve corporate problems and they're like, yeah, I want to get divorced, right? But by recrafting my experience, it is a compelling story that could then translate, okay? And it's, a, it's, an, it's, the, art of, it's a, the art of communication. Okay, good. Um, Eric. Okay. Yes. May, may I go? I have a question. How are we defining uh, failure? in this situation when we tell our stories. Because yeah. I think many times we think of failure as with shame and guilt, but how in this way when we're writing it, it seems to also come from a place of empowerment. Could you speak a little bit yeah. more about what you mean by failure? Yes, so um, I'll give you, I'll give you a pers my personal example and you'll see what you think, whether you think it's a failure. And you're right, failure is a very strong word, but I do mean it pretty strongly because it will resonate with people because we've all failed, right? So for me, in 2008, uh, my three biggest clients, I was still doing HR consulting and coaching, were Bank of America, Lehman Brothers, and AIG. 
And I was planning my son's bar mitzvah and I had spent a hundred thousand dollars on the bar mitzvah because in New York, it's like super expensive to have a bar mitzvah. And basically in the space of a week, all three of those clients, I mean, basically went bankrupt. So I was massively in debt. I had a huge party and I changed my business completely. And I view that as a big failure because I just imagined the world was going to go on exactly as it was going forever and ever and ever. Okay. Now, was that a failure like that I did, did or didn't predict the 2008 collapse or that I really wanted my son to have a beautiful bar mitzvah? No. But for me personally, it, it just tells you a lot about how I think and what I do and how resilient I am. Right. Okay. So to your question, when I say failure, I go as, I, you can even go to Shane in the story and to, you know, whatever it is you feel is strongly, but it's a story. So it must be redemptive because every hero story, Odysseus gets home. He gets home. So I say go deep. And when crafted well, for, for example, uh, you tell it well to a, a potential employer and they've been through failure, they're going to trust you, right? So sounding perfect, looking perfect is really not attractive, actually. Um, how did I do on that one? You did perfectly. Perfectly, I, thank you. Okay, so really do that. But, but think about your, for, your three positive stories. They can also build up to that collapse. Right. And if you're younger, you know what, maybe you don't have like that kind of collapse. But it's I, when I work with a lot of Colombian people, a lot of times they they're very about their successes. Right. You know, they really have a hard time sharing a failure, but it's really what makes us human. And that's what makes us interesting. Um, OK. Any other questions? That was a good one. Thoughts. All right. Um, what I'd like to ask is three people to volunteer to say what's one thing they're going to take away from this whole uh, hour and a half. I, I would say the power of positive thinking. I think I've always been, I, I think I realize I need to do a lot more work to take my day seriously and the hour seriously and turn every moment into a moment for inspiration and empowerment. So thank you for that. That's awesome. And with such diligence, right? What you think, what you eat, everything is driving that. Very good. Remember, yes, good. Okay, who else? Someone else. Leveraging your failure as a source of strength and making it a part of your story. Yes, making it, and especially for our community, making it maybe the best story, right? Because a lot of people now know what it feels like to live through a virus. Right. So our challenges, the isolation, a lot of the things that LGBT people go through, you know what, maybe the world is starting to see some of those things, too. So your experience, which we say it's your failure, but we could all say your experience is very valuable. OK. One more. Takeaway. Volunteer. Right. Uh, giving, so you're going to get. Give first. Okay, good. Okay, so I just want to, let me, thank you very much. And I want to also thank everybody for, for joining and for taking the time and for being open to inspiration. So I'm just going to leave with a couple things. Number one is, this is recorded, so you will be able to uh, watch it again. I would like to figure out a way maybe to be able to share the PowerPoint with everybody who attended um, so you can look back at it. Um, this, is a, like, this is a commitment to your personal success that is in your hands. This is all what you can do, okay? Because there's so many things that you can't control. So I'm really framing for you the way you can think and be and do that you can control. Um, and then if you, for example, someone said they're interested in learning more about the Generations Project, I, um, uh, we, I, I, can, I think I shared in the invitation, the link, and if you're interested, you can also connect with me about it. 
Uh, it's very important to be able to tell your story if you want to tell your story or to contribute to somebody else's story and to make sure that we are not marginalized or silenced uh, during this time. And that comes because we tell our stories and our stories are important and we're saving them, we're recording them and um, we're, we're building our history. And that's a beautiful thing. So, and I really want to thank Carlos and Jenna and Adam for, for having this and hopefully we'll have more programming to support our community and stick together. And we'll look back at this time in our lives and we'll say what heroes we were. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. All right, guys, hang in there. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah. Um, be on the lookout for our next event, probably sometime in the next couple of months. Um, and I found this really inspiring, so I hope everybody else did as well. Thank I you. have work to do, so. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I have to write my stories. Write your stories. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. good night. Thank you.